Georgetown after failing to report alleged sex abuse was named pastor of the Corpus Christi and St. John Newman parishes. For more news with a Catholic perspective, visit EWTNnews.com. I'm Teresa Tamio, and Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders starts now. What's stopping you from becoming a Catholic? Why can't women become priests? 1-833-288-EWTN. I don't understand why I have to earn salvation. 1-833-288-3986. What's stopping? Why do I need to confess my sins to a priest? What's stopping you? This is Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Hey everybody, welcome again to Call to Communion here on EWTN. This is the program for our non-Catholic brothers and sisters. If you have a question about the Catholic faith, or maybe you'd just like to tell us why you are not a Catholic, we'd love to hear about that. 833-288-EWTN is our phone number. Call it uh, toll-free right now, 833-288-3986. Now, if you're listening to us outside of uh, North America, please dial the U.S. country code and then 205-271-2985. You can also text the letters EWTN to 55000. Wait for our quick response. It'll take really literally five seconds. And then as soon as you get that, then you can put in your first name and your brief question. Message and data rates may apply. And of course, you can always send us an email, ctc at EWTN.com, ctc at EWTN.com. Charles Beery is our producer. Ryan Penny is our phone screener. Jeff Burson is on social media. If you want to ask your question via YouTube or Facebook, you can do that right now just by going to the comments section, putting in your question. Jeff will shoot that to us here in the studio. I'm Tom Price along with Dr. David Anders. Tom, how are you today? Very well. How are you, my friend? Oh, you know, I'm hanging in there. Thank you. Quick uh, lunchtime update. What was it today? Uh, brown rice, quinoa, broccoli, mushrooms, tomatoes, grapes, green tea, you know, just standard kind of Anders fare. You are so doggone healthy. I'm working on it. I'm, I'm glad. <laughs> uh, we, we want you around here for a while. Well, I appreciate that. <laughs> We're going to lead off with an email from Joe who says, why should I be Catholic? Don't all religions worship the same God? Okay, thanks. I really appreciate the question. Uh, those, are, those are two different questions, actually. And with respect to the first question, don't all religions worship the same God? I think that's pretty manifestly false, right? That's pretty manifestly false. So, uh, you know, when the ancient Phoenicians, for example, were offering human sacrifice of, of human infants, uh, this is clearly not something the God of the Hebrews condoned, right? And their God did, right? And the Babylonian fertility gods uh, had completely different interests and personality and required a different kind of worship. And uh, the Scripture is constantly drawing attention to this contrast between the God of the nations and, and the God of uh, the children of Abraham. And uh, I think, you know, the story of, uh, of Elijah and the prophets of Baal is, uh, is illustrative because they think that the way to get God's attention is to get into a sort of frenzy and dance around and cut themselves and do all kinds of wild stuff. And, uh, and Elijah ultimately finds that the way to connect with the God of the Hebrews is through the inner life, the still small voice that speaks to him, not in the fire, not in the whirlwind, not in the, the big frenetic show, but in the transformation of one's interior life, one's moral life. So, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the ends and aims of religious practice differ across cultures and across religions, and the conception of God is very different. And even in the major monotheistic religions that are around today. Not a lot of people worshiping Marduk or Phoenician deities, but there are other people who worship a you know, monotheistic conception of God. Even though, even that, there are some significant differences between the Catholic understanding of God and other religions. And in particular, uh, is something that Pope Benedict drew attention to uh, poignantly in his Regensburg lecture. Some religious traditions conceive of God as a sort of pure uh, will. That God can just do whatever he wants. He's unconstrained by anything outside his own nature, and that means that we can't know anything reasonably about God. And If God commanded us to murder and commit adultery, that'd be the right thing to do. And that's not the way Catholics conceive of the nature of God. But God is not constrained by anything outside his nature, but his nature is it has a determinate 
aspect to it, and he doesn't behave in an arbitrary way. God's will and God's reason are ultimately the same thing. And so to act against reason is to act against the nature and the will of God. That's the Catholic understanding. And this really plays out profound differences in the way we understand the moral life and the ends and purposes of human life. So you have some traditions, for example, that say, well, it's okay to go on a religious warfare rampage and and take prisoners and sell women into sex slavery and, you know, force uh, conquest on other people at the point of the sword. And then you have the Catholic tradition that says, uh, well, no, actually you should go chasing down those people and give your lives for them and love them, even though they may call you enemies. And you should forgive them and practice the Beatitudes and be humble and peace, uh, peacemaker and, and meek and hunger and thirst and righteousness and uh, be willing to suffer for righteousness' sake. So profoundly different ethic understanding of the nature of human life. So really, I don't think we can say at all that all religions are the same or that every conception of God is the same. Um, as to your first question, why should you become Catholic? Well, I would hope you would become Catholic in order to grow in charity and become more like Christ uh, and, uh, and to become more fully the person that you already are, right? God made us in his likeness and image, means he gave us this capacity for rationality, human freedom, and ultimately for being able to give ourselves in the kind of relationship that we call love. And, uh, and, but we all have a hard time doing that. We act irrationally. You know, Our wills and our passions are not always uh, in submission to our, our better judgment, and we have a hard time loving ourselves and other people. And We need grace in order to do that. And the promise of the Catholic faith is that we regain in Christ what we lost in Adam, namely to be in the likeness and image of God. All right, and we thank you so much uh, for your email, Joe. Here's a quick question now from uh, Rosa on YouTube. Rosa says, my daughter was told we do not need to pray to Mother Mary. Is that true? What advice can I give her? Okay, um, yes. So, you know, I would love to know what the context of that remark was and who made it, right? Because it would kind of depend on who said it and what they thought they meant. Mm -hmm. Uh uh, it, it, the simplest way to answer this question of, of course, we need to pray to Mother Mary because God has commanded us to do so and desires that we do so um, because he doesn't want to save us apart from the communion of saints, apart from the fellowship of his body, which is the church. You know, there are some religious traditions, not the Catholic faith, that think that salvation means sort of being yanked out of society and history and time and space into this sort of utterly interior and personal relationship with God that can ignore my neighbor. That's kind of how they think about mm. salvation. The uh, Catholic Church doesn't think that. It thinks that the, the life that we live in the flesh is very much intertwined with our hope for eternity. And, you know, the biggest problem that every uh, orangutan has is other orangutans, right? <laughs> well, the biggest problem that most people have is other people, mm, and yeah. learning how to live well together and charitably is, uh, is quite a challenge. And so salvation means correcting these wounds of human nature, enabling us to live charitably with one another, and so we are saved in and through a society. And the most important members of that society actually are the saints who've gone before us, and Mother Mary is the greatest of all the saints. So we need to be saved in, with, and through the communion of saints and their intercession. Rosa, thanks for your question. Lines are open now at 833-288-EWTN for Call to Communion. The leading Catholic voices are on EWTN Radio. We've started doing these shows, call in if you're an atheist, call in if you want to redefine marriage. Those are the kind of shows that make very engaging radio. We're going to continue to try to reach out to the fringes and find those people who fundamentally disagree with us. And we're going to continue to create shows that are going to reach out to those people to draw them in to the fullness of the truth. Catholic Answers Live, tonight, 6 Eastern, on EWTN Radio. Now we have another thought for you from Mother Angelica's Perpetual Calendar. The whole object of our life is to turn everything into good. If I want to imitate Jesus, I have to turn everything into good, just like he does. Mother Angelica's Perpetual Calendar features an inspirational message for each day of the year. It's available at EWTNRC.com. That's EWTNRC.com. We pray because we want to come into union with God. He wants to breathe His life into us, and we want to accept that life. Because in accepting that life, we begin to experience the abundance that He has in mind for us to receive. 
Pray to God. Lift your praises high to God and present to Him every supplication that you might find the grace you need for the present moment that He presents to you. Everything good comes from prayer, says Mother Teresa of Calcutta, and so it is true. It's called a communion here on EWTN. Our phone number 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. I want to tell you about something that is really cool and it's available right now from our religious catalog, EWTNRC.com. It is a St. Joseph Terror of Demons Genuine Pewter Pendant. This is awesome. It's a nicely detailed pewter medal featuring a beautiful image of the Holy Family with St. Joseph, Terror of Demons, shown using his staff as a spear, pinning a demon under his foot. Now, you know, the title Terror of Demons is taken from the powerful Litany of St. Joseph. And I know that our friend Father Wade Menezes likes to uh, always invoke St. Joseph, Terror of Demons, pray for us. Well, this genuine pewter oval medal is packaged with an embossed decorative pamphlet that contains information about St. Joseph and a prayer just for you. It comes with a 24-inch stainless steel endless chain, very nice, exclusively uh, designed for EWTN, so it's quite unique, available right now at EWTNRC.com. There's free standard shipping on online orders of $75 or more, and uh, that is for the continental U.S. only. Uh, be sure to use the code FREE at checkout. Again, uh, you can check it out by going to EWTNRC.com. Look for that St. Joseph Terror of Demons Genuine Pewter Pendant. It is fantastic. If you're ready now, let's go to the phones at 833-288-EWTN. We begin with John. John is in New Orleans listening on Catholic Community Radio, a first-time caller. Hello, John. What's on your mind today? Good afternoon. I'm, I'm, I'm getting to be an unpracticing Catholic, and I'll tell you why. My Protestant friends say, why should they become a Catholic? The Catholic Church don't enforce the rules. For instance, they're against abortion and same-sex marriage, but Joe Biden gets absolution and communion from the Catholic Church when it's against the laws of the Church. How can that be? There's no reason for it. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I really appreciate the question. So I guess where I'm stumbling a little bit over the question is why why I should concern myself with some other Catholics' practice of the faith and some other bishops' administration of church law uh, and how, how that affects my own life of faith, hope, and charity. Now, it's a scandal if somebody in the church is doing wrong and they're not held accountable in the proper way. That, would, that could be potentially scandalous. Uh, and Christ says a lot about scandal in the Gospels. He says, woe to those that call scandal. Better that they be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck. I mean, it's bad news to call scandal. But, uh, but if I'm well instructed in the faith, I understand that, you know, bishops and politicians are human beings, and, uh, and, and they have, may have various motives for their activities, but I'm not judged by them. You know, I'm judged by my adherence to the truth and my own progress in faith and charity. And uh, and it could be a convenient excuse for me to plead scandal in somebody else's case. And, well, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to live my life well because this other guy's not doing a great job. Uh, that's not going to get me off the hook, right? And I, I understand that, that uh, people do things, right? That's part of the human condition. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and that's not going to stop because I become Catholic or not. I mean, Jesus himself, when he talks about the nature of the church, he, he explicitly teaches us it's going to consist of wheat and tares, good and bad, right and wrong, people with good judgment, people with bad judgment. And, uh, and that will be a perennial source of scandal to, the, to you know, people with weak consciences, and so those who call scandal are responsible for that. Uh, but he doesn't say that there's not going to be scandal. He says there are going to be scandals, and there are going to be controversies, and there, there, there are going to be you know, people of, sort of varied moral conditions in the Church, uh, because the Church is a collection of sinners who are trying to be saints, right? I mean, that's why we have the Sacrament of Reconciliation. Jesus gave this sacrament to the Church because he expected the members of his Church to commit grave sin, that's why the discipline exists. It doesn't exist for the sake of venial sins. I mean, it can be used for that, yeah. but it, it exists for the sake of reconciling major sinners within the Catholic faith. And we hope it be used well, right? So, you know, I guess from my point of view, what's more pertinent is, is the faith true? Does it make people holy? Does it, does it bring us to God? And the proof of that is not in its, uh, uh, the members that fail, but in the ones that succeed. So I look to the saints, well, you know, did it, did it bring them to God? Did it bring them to holiness of life? Well, yeah, it was very effective. That's the proof. 
when somebody doesn't make use of the sacraments and doesn't live a holy life, that doesn't disprove the faith. It just proves that they didn't lay hold of it. They didn't cooperate with yeah. it. Now, when it comes to you know this specific issue, um, you know, not talking in general terms, but specifically, I mean, it's way above my pay grade to judge you know why some particular bishop exercises his office the way he does, what his reasons, what he may be doing behind the scenes that I don't know about, uh, what kind of uh, theological or political calculations enter into his judgment. Uh, and fortunately, it's not my job to judge that. You know, the Holy Spirit will judge it, and he'll judge people's hearts, and, and that's not up to me to determine, and I'm glad I'm not, you know, uh, I'm not in the position of having to make those calls. Being a bishop is a tough business. They're under a lot of pressure, and, and they're human beings. And, and we can sit back and say, well, that was a good judgment, that was a bad judgment. Uh, we can pass judgment ourselves on their, on their prudential decision-making. Um, it's not really our job to do so. Um, and, uh, but again, my faith doesn't stand or fall on the way some bishop conducts himself. He could be wise and prudent. He could be foolish and, and uh, politically motivated. It's really beyond my purview to make that judgment. Thanks so much for your call from New Orleans. That opens up a line for you right now at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986, the Wednesday afternoon edition of Call to Communion here on EWTN. Let's go to Bill in Toledo now, listening on the great Annunciation Radio. Hello, Bill. What's on your mind today? Yeah, hi, Dr. Anders. Uh, yeah, I was, was just wondering about Matthew 23, uh, nine, sure. where Jesus tells us uh, that we are uh, all no man your father on earth. Uh, what does that mean? Yeah, uh, thanks. Yeah, I, I really appreciate it. So there, there are a number of passages in sacred scripture where Christ talks about familial relations. And the, the most stark is even more striking than this. He says, if you don't hate your father and mother and wives and children and your own life, you can't be my disciple. And he also says, don't call anybody rabbi, don't call anybody teacher, don't call anybody father. Now, one thing he clearly does not have in mind in this passage, he's absolutely not talking about the Catholic priesthood. There's just no mention of that context at all. I mean, the context has to do with normal biological familial relations. And what he's aiming at, right, I mean, John the Baptist sort of touches on the same thing in his ministry. He says to the Pharisees, John the Baptist does, I don't say that you have Abraham for your father. Don't say that. Don't think that God's going to give you a pass because you have Abraham as your father. God can raise up children for Abraham from these very stones, rather bring forth fruits in keeping with your repentance. That's the message of John the Baptist. You cannot rely on your physical parentage. You know, your heritage, uh, your race, ethnicity, nationality, you know, that you belong to the Rotary Club, whatever it might be. You can't <laughs> rely on these things to get you into heaven. You have to have a change of life. And those things can be, they can be a, an impediment to the life of holiness, right? I mean, nothing wrong with family relations. I love my father, love my mother, love my sibling and my children. Uh, but misconstrued, those things can distract us from the life of holiness if the people around us are trying to drag us down. I mean, I yeah. can't tell you the number of times on this show we hear from people to say, well, I'd like to become a Catholic, but but my wife, my husband, mm -hmm. my parents, my mm -hmm. children, but, but, but. And Christ tells us we can't be those kind of buts. You know, if your conscience calls you to become Catholic, you have to follow your conscience. And ultimately, you're not going to be a good son, a good father, a good husband, a good wife, if you live in disobedience to conscience. Yeah. That's all there is to it. Appreciate your call, Bill. It is called a communion here on EWTN. Uh, Jeremy's watching us on YouTube right now. Jeremy says, three big errors that prevent me from becoming a Catholic are the sale of indulgences, the Crusades, and the resistance to translating Scripture to the point of persecution. So if the Pope sanctioned these things, how can he be infallible? Okay, so let me answer in a general sense about the Pope's infallibility, and then we'll maybe dig into some of these specifics. All First right. of all, infallibility does not mean that the Pope has good judgment. It doesn't mean that at all. I mean, and there's, there's absolutely no reason, there's no obligation, Catholics are not obligated to think that prelates and ordinaries and bishops and priests or themselves have good judgment. Not, not obligated to think that. And obviously there have been many popes and bishops in history that have had just horrific, atrocious judgment, have done really crazy things. That's why Dante in his fictional poem, The Divine Comedy, he sticks some popes in hell. Yeah, It was really bad judgment. I mean, grievously bad judgment. 
we're not obligated to think that popes or bishops or priests have good judgment. You know, what, the Pope has a lot of jobs. Wears a lot. Well, he wears one big hat, right? But, <laughs> um, you know, back in the old day, the tiara looked like a bunch of hats stacked on did. top of each other, right? You know, uh, has a lot of different uh, jobs he has to do in the church. And most important one, of course, is to, is to keep the faith. And when he does that, when he actually teaches a matter of faith and morals to be held definitively by all the faithful, that act of teaching can be done well or badly, can be done prudently or imprudently, can be done in an opportune time or an inopportune time. But if he declares something to be a, a matter to, definitively held by Catholics in faith and morals, and he's preserved from error. That's all the Church says. He's preserved from error. Error about the fact of the teaching. He's not preserved from bad judgment. Right. Now, let me, let me really dig into this for a second, because it's an it's interesting point. There's a Catholic saint. Pope Francis made him a saint. Uh, saint uh, John Henry Cardinal Newman probably the greatest Catholic theologian of the 19th century, and one of the greatest modern Catholic theologians. Pope Benedict beatified him, Pope Francis uh, canonized him. So you understand he really has the approval of the church hierarchy of the popes. Um, and uh, uh, Newman did, said two things really, really interesting on this question. One is he was asked one time about a conscience versus obedience to the pope. And he said, well, if I had to give a dinner table toast, which would be in kind of bad taste, but if I had to do it, he said, I would toast conscience first and then the Pope. Wow. Right? And the reason why is if you say you're not obligated to obey conscience, well, then what grounds would you obey anybody? Like conscience is the, he called it the aboriginal vicar of Christ. You've got to listen to conscience to listen to anybody else. Hmm. Conscience comes first. If anybody ever commit, Pope or otherwise, St. Paul said, if I myself or any apostle or anyone tells you to believe a gospel other than the one you have received, let him be anathema. Right? You have to obey conscience first. Right? Second thing that Newman did that was interesting is uh, he really didn't like Pope Pius IX very much. I mean, that's kind of an understatement. He really strongly didn't like Pope Pius IX. And Pius IX called the First Vatican Council, which defined the dogma of papal infallibility. And Newman, of course, believed the council, because he believed in the dogma of papal infallibility. Mm -hmm. But he thought it was inopportune to define so he was what you called an inopportunist. He said, look, I believe the, I believe the doctrine. It's true doctrine. Uh -huh. But the church ought not to have defined it. Now, you know, subsequent opinion probably thinks that Newman was wrong on that, but it doesn't matter. My point is, it's not incoherent to think that the Pope could say something infallibly true badly. Like, that's how nuanced the doctrine is. Two plus two equals four. Well, that's true. But it's a weird thing to say in a Catholic radio show. That was an inopportune <laughs> assertion, right? You can hold that the Pope acts inopportunely. You can hold that he acts, you know, not judiciously. You can ha hold that he acts foolishly. Sometimes he may act just positively immorally. Imagine the Pope who, as a matter of policy, decides to declare war on a Venetian, you know, on, on the city-state of Venice or something, mm. as they were wont to do in the Middle Ages. Yeah. You know, I mean, they did that. It's a matter of papal policy. Let's go to war. Get on the horse, pick up a sword, go lop some heads, right? Bad judgment. Not good church policy. Plenty of people at the time said, mm, not good, Mr. Pope, not good. <laughs> You're allowed to hold that, all right? Uh, now, on the specific um, issues that you raise, sale of indulgences, well, you know, we're with you on that. Not a good idea. Not a good, big occasion of scandal. Now, you know, to give you an idea of how that could evolve and how anybody could possibly have ever thought that was an okay thing to do, um, you know, the idea of doing penance, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make some offering in reparation for my sin. That's a biblical idea. It's clearly a patristic idea. It's a Catholic idea. And, you know, Christ himself appoints three specific kinds of penance, all right, prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. When you, when you pray in secret, you know, your Father in secret rewards you. When you give alms, give alms in secret, your Father in secret, Caesar in secret will reward you. When you fast, fast in secret, your Father will reward you. Christ is the one who says we can do these kinds of activities and merit reward from God. And so when a priest assigns a penance to a penitent or, you know, the context of an indulgence, it'd be appropriate to say, well, you know, give alms or, or you know, go say these prayers or maybe you should fast— and, uh, and, you know, there was a little creep, little indulgence creep over time, and give alms. Well, here, here's a good project. You know, well, they're, you know, they're building this new shrine over here. Why don't you donate something to that? That'd be a nice penance for you, you know. And you see how that get a little out of hand. Oh, yeah. And that's basically what happened. It's, you know, a practice that was pious in origin 
uh, you know, you get some corrupt and, and self-motivated people involved, and something that's uh, that's not bad in its its genesis becomes quite corrupt over time. And, of course, the Church recognized this, and Luther's not the only one that recognized it. There are other Catholic reformers at the time said, look, this is a scandal, we need to get rid of this. Of course, today it's illegal to sell indulgences. Yep. Um, it comes to the other two questions were, oh, the Crusades. Uh, not enough time to do too much on the Crusades, except this. What would you do if you lived in Northern Europe in uh, uh, in the uh, late Middle Ages, high Middle Ages, and uh, Muslims had completely devastated the Christian nation of Egypt, of Jerusalem, of North Africa, which was entirely Christian. They'd taken over Baghdad, that used to be the largest Christian diocese in the world. They'd taken over Persia, that had a large Nestorian Christian population. The historic heartland of the Christian faith, which was the Middle East and North Africa and Asia Minor, had been completely devastated by Muslim advances, and they'd pushed all the way to the city of Tours in France, and they had avowedly imperialistic ideas, colonial ideas about conquering uh, Western Europe, making it Muslim. And, of course, in the 16th century, they pushed them all the way to the gates of Vienna, um, they were literally kidnapping Christian girls out of their beds at night from the coasts of Italy, and they said, "We will bury you." You know, like uh, Khrushchev, like Khrushchev said, yeah. right? And uh, and you're, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? You're going to take up arms and you're going to fight back. Sure, trying to defend your lands. Yeah, and that's the context of the Crusades. Okay, very good. And we thank you so much uh, for checking in with us on uh, YouTube, Jeremy. Appreciate that. In a moment, we're going to get back to the phones. Talk with Sal in Detroit, listening on Ave Maria Radio. We've got a line open with your name on it as well. Eight three three two eight eight E W T N. That's eight three three two eight eight three nine eight six. The Wednesday afternoon edition of Call to Communion. Stay with us. In this year of St. Joseph, join us and make the 33-day consecration to St. Joseph tonight, 9 Eastern, after the Rosary with Father Groeschel on EWTN Radio. Why do we need to pray? We don't pray because God needs our prayers. We pray because we need God's grace. And every day when I face the day, I realize I have no idea what I'm doing <laughs> and I need God to walk me through my day step by step, giving me the grace, the counsel, the love, the encouragement that enables me to glorify him in everything that I do and become the person he wants me to be. Prayer is my lifeline. Father Benedict Rochelle. There are legitimate differences of opinion in any religion. There are differences of opinion in Catholicism. But in Catholicism, you expect that people will take the teaching of its supreme authority seriously. To go diametrically opposed to those teachings is to not be a Catholic. Someone in the name of Catholicism is sponsoring the destruction of human life, lives of unborn children. And they got the name Catholic on the door. The highest authority in Catholicism and the encyclical Humanae Vitae, Evangelium Vitae, is absolutely clear that no Catholic can support abortion and that Catholics are responsible to take serious action against legalized abortion. The people you know and trust are on EWTN. Hi, this is Cy Kellett. Later today on Catholic Answers Live, Carla Broussard, Why It Matters to Be Catholic. Catholic Answers Live, 6 p.m. Eastern on EWTN Radio. Now, back to Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders. Glad you could join us for Call to Communion here on EWTN. Three lines open. Three lines are in the screening process right now. 833-288-EWTN if you want to snag a line. 833-288-3986. Let's go to Sal right now. Sal is in Detroit listening on the great Ave Maria radio, a first-time caller. Hey, Sal, what's on your mind today? Yeah, thank you for taking my call. Um, Jesus was to claim he is our good shepherd, and he doesn't want anyone to perish. When he was on the cross on Good Friday, he promised the robber on the right, today will be in paradise. You expect him to look to the one on the left who is dying. Why didn't he say, how about you? I mean, you know, uh, after all, the scripture is silent about this. Yeah, thank, what a great question. Really appreciate that. So, 
you know, the story of uh, St. Dismas, the thief on the cross, the good thief, as you know, the whole context, the, the other thief begins to abuse Christ and to curse him. And, uh, uh, and St. Dismas rebukes the other thief and says, you and I are getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. And then he makes an appeal to Christ for mercy. Lord Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So he had had a conversion. Dismas had had a conversion at the moment of death. And uh, he performed a number of good deeds, even from the cross. He made an act of faith. Uh, he admonished a sinner. He made a humble confession of sins. He made an appeal to Christ for mercy. And, uh, you know, God offers his grace to everyone, but we have to cooperate with that grace in order to receive it. And the way we co cooperate is by contrition and confession and, uh, and acts of faith, hope, and charity. That's how we cooperate. And St. Dismas did that. Now, obviously, we don't really know what happens in the soul of any man at the hour of death unless Christ reveals it to us. And Christ revealed to us that St. Dismas goes to heaven. He didn't tell us the other guy goes to hell. We're just kind of left in the dark on that one. Mm -hmm. But I think that the, that the, the story is in sacred scripture because it's profoundly illustrative of two modes of life, two ways of being in the world, and it's meant to teach us something. It is possible to die unrepentant. It is also possible at the moment of your death to be repentant. And so they remain forever for us as a powerful motive and an example of how to live and how not to live. There you go. Appreciate that. Sal, thank you so much for your call. Good to hear you uh, in Detroit today. Let's uh, go back now to the phones and talk with David. David is in Nashville listening on the EWTN app. Hey there, David, what's on your mind today? Hey, good evening, Dr. Anders. Um, my wife actually came into the church at uh, Easter, and I'm kind of thinking I'm coming in as well. Um, but I've, I've seen some um, arguments and, and articles about, um, I think it's SS, PX, yes. and there's um, Steady, um, I can't, it's hard for me to say, Steady Vacant. Steady Vacantism, um, yeah. Anyway, it, they seem to have like this, mo um, like they're a superior true Catholic church, and I guess they they make it seem like apostolic secession has halted for the majority of Catholics, and they're superior, and it's just, I've seen some very just, just they're almost like very hateful towards Catholics, but claim to be Catholics. And I was just curious if you could explain that to me, sir. Yeah, sure, absolutely. So, so first of all, the SSPX are not set of acantists, but there are other groups that are. So let me define our terms and kind of explain it if I can. So um, after the Second Vatican Council, there was a French archbishop by the name of Lefebvre who formed a priestly society called the Society of St. Pius X in order to perpetuate uh, the, the sort of spirit and ethos of traditional Catholicism, and especially the, the traditional Mass from the Council of Trent, and, uh, and had some problems with the formulations of the Second Vatican Council. Now, uh, up, 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 as, as far as it went, that was all right. I mean, you know, it, it's not an impious thought to think, well, you know, this council or that council could have done things better. That's all right. I mean, you can think. That's why we had the first four ecumenical councils of the church, because we didn't get the job done at Nicaea I. So we had to follow it up, you know, with, uh, with Chalcedon and the fourth uh, yeah. ecumenical council yeah. and, uh, and so forth, and Ephesus and all the rest mm -hmm. of them. Um, and uh, so it's okay for to say, well, you know, we did something good, but we could, we could improve. We could do better. Let's have another council and do mm -hmm. some more work, right? That's not an impious attitude. Um, and the problem was that uh, Archbishop Lefebvre began to take a very oppositional attitude towards the hierarchy and the Pope and the rest of the Church. And, and Pope John Paul II said, you can't ordain bishops for your society. I mean, you can have a society, but you can't ordain bishops. Well, he went and ordained bishops anyway because he thought he was smarter than the Pope in a direct act of disobedience, whereupon he incurred the discipline of excommunication. He and all the bishops along with him and everybody else in the society got excommunicated. And they just kept on going, right? And uh, now, since then, the Church has done a lot to try to reconcile these folks, has lifted the decree of excommunication. Pope Francis even extended some special priestly faculties to members of their society so they can celebrate some of the sacraments for their own people. Uh, but all the while, they exist without any lawful jurisdiction in the Catholic Church. They have bishops, but they don't have any dioceses. So they don't actually enjoy any lawful jurisdiction in the Church, um, and they don't have any kind of canonical status, and they operate in direct disobedience to the Pope. 
So the concessions that the Pope has made to the society are really just for the sake of the care of souls, people who've grown up in that society and never been really in communion with the Bishop of Rome or the bishops throughout the world, uh, you know, caring for those souls. The Pope says, okay, well, you can celebrate some sacraments for them, but you guys really got to come back. You got to come back into the obedience of the universal church. And they refuse. So they're really, they're in a state of disobedience. And what motivates them, of course, is ideology. They have a, they have a traditionalist, I won't say traditional, I call it traditionalist ideology. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and they've put their own judgment about the council and the church ahead of the virtue of obedience, right? And that's really not a very Catholic disposition. Uh, you know, throughout history, the saints uh, would uh, write these great theology texts, and they would usually append a kind of forward and say, well, this is what I think. But if I'm wrong on anything, I defer to the church. Yeah. And uh, it'd be great if the SSPX would do that. That's what we think. But if we're wrong on any of this, we'd defer to the Pope. That'd be great, but they're not doing that. So they're not in obedience to the Church. Um, now, with, with, when it comes to the, these groups that you call Sedevacantists, these are people—this uh, is the lunatic nutjob wing of the far right, to be honest with you. These are the guys that think that there is no Pope, right? They just think there's no Pope, yeah. that, that Pope Francis is not the Pope, and Benedict wasn't the Pope, and John Paul wasn't the Pope. Um, they think the, 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 the Sea of Peter is empty. Now, um, you know, you can, you can tie these guys down and they'll talk you a blue streak about canon law or this, that, or the other thing. But what it boils down to is they think that their private judgment of the intricacies of law and tradition is the final court of appeal. Right? So that's essentially a kind of Protestantism. You know, I, I and my conscience, my judgment, my theorizing are the highest authority. Now, uh, St. Augustine, way back in the 4th century, dealt with a similar group called the Donatists. They thought they were the only Catholic church. They thought they had the goods, and all the, all the other Catholics were out to lunch. And Augustine had a wonderful response to these folks. He said, you guys can't be the Catholic church because you're just in North Africa. <laughs> and Catholic means universal. <laughs> yes. And we got, we got like a ton of bishops all over the world, and they all know where the Catholic church is. You guys can't be the Catholic Church. And a response to the set of Acantists is the same thing, right? The Second Vatican Council was called by Pope. It was the best attended council in the history of the Church, and bishops from all over the world. Every bishop in the entire world, they knew who the Pope was, John 23rd. They knew who the Pope that finished it was, Paul VI. They know who the Pope is now. I mean, heck, you can go out on the street in New York, stop a cab, and ask a guy in the cab, who's the Pope? He'll tell you, it's the, the guy in Rome, you know, Francis, that guy. I mean, it's as obvious as the nose on your face. That's why I say it's a lunatic position, right? Mm. The entire world knows who the Pope is. All the bishops of the Catholic Church know who the Pope is, right? I mean, this is tantamount to saying the earth is flat. By the way, some of those guys think the earth is flat. (laughs) I mean, I'm serious, all right? I mean, I've talked to some of them, right? So uh, if being Catholic is about being conformed to Christ, that's what it's about. It's about trying to be transformed in my interior life in faith and charity so that I can manifest the Beatitudes. But poor in spirit, peacemaker, meek, humble, hunger and thirst for righteousness, pure in heart. That's what, that's what being Catholic is about, trying to live the life of Christ after him. I in him and he in me, right? It's not about trying to, uh, to, to concoct some ideologically pure system some puritanical sect, and then lord it over the rest of humanity. Yeah. That's not the end of the Catholic faith. Okay. Is that uh, helpful for you, David? Uh, very much so, and I, I really appreciate the, the touch on the pubs, too, because you see the argument that no valid pubs since 1958. I was like, this is very odd. And then yeah. I, I even saw another argument that the uh, chaplet of Divine Mercy was a false devotion, that there's a, only supposed to be like a devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And I was like, well, this is... Even being a non-Catholic, you hear about the Divine Mercy Chaplet. I was just trying. It, it seemed like they were just kind of butting heads with the, the Roman Catholic Church. Well, so, they make yeah. Jesus into a liar, because Christ said the gates of hell would not prevail against the Church, and yeah. they think it prevailed. That's not where we want to no. be. <laughs> David, thank you so much for your call. It is called a communion here on EWTN. Couple of lines open for you at eight three three. 
833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. I want to tell you about one of our wonderful weekend programs, Conversations with Consequences. We air it Saturday mornings at 7 a.m. Eastern, and we have an encore of the program at 5 p.m. Eastern, in case you didn't catch that early morning airing. Dr. Gracie Christie and the women of the Catholic Association will be along to discuss issues that matter to a well-formed Catholic audience. Do check it out. I think you'll find it fascinating. Conversations with Consequences, Saturday morning, 7 a.m. Eastern, and also at 5 p.m. Eastern on EWTN Radio. Back to the phones now at 833-288-EWTN. Here is Michael in Bethesda, Maryland, listening on Guadalupe Radio. Hey, Michael, what's on your mind today? Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. So I had a question about sort of a why behind divine revelation. How come um, either in public or private revelation, um, there's not, or well, maybe not now, but there isn't usually um, any divine revelation of material or scientific truths, like either in the Bible or to the saints or to the Church in some other way? Yeah, thanks. appreciate the question. I do think we'll have to qualify it a little bit. Um, but uh, the simple answer was given by Galileo, who was a Catholic, believe it or not, uh, and it was that divine revelation is given to us to tell us how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. And uh, that's a simple answer, right? That divine revelation is appointed for our salvation and that we might live well together as humans in faith, hope, and charity, right? And, uh, and manifest the kingdom of God, which is Christ's reign in the hearts of his people. So that's the simple answer. And uh, that's what it's for. That's what it's appointed for. Now, um, it's not true, however, to suggest that divine revelation has no significance for our understanding or engagement in the natural world. On the contrary, the Christian doctrine of creation, the Christian doctrine of God, uh, the Christian doctrine of reason, and we have a very robust doctrine of reason, um, uh, the, uh, uh, and the Christian doctrine of the dignity of the human person, all had a profound impact on the evolution of Western consciousness and on the advent of the scientific revolution. It is extremely significant that the scientific revolution occurred in the 17th century in, in, uh, in the Latin Catholic West and no place else in the world. It didn't occur in any other place in the world. And the reason it occurred in the Latin Catholic West was because of the intellectual work that Catholic theologians had done, especially in the scholastic period of the High Middle Ages and Late Middle Ages, uh, developing theories of necessity and contingency. And, uh, and Jean Bourdin, who was a scholastic theologian who invented the theory of impetus that ultimately became uh, Newton's uh, um, uh, law of inertia, uh, and all of these things were developed within an explicitly theological milieu, right? And apart from that theological milieu, you wouldn't have had those scientific developments. Someone who's done a lot of work on that topic you might find interesting is the Catholic uh, theoretical physicist and priest and Benedictine monk, Stanley Yaki, J-A-K-I. His book, The Savior of Science, is about Christ as the progenitor, really, of the scientific revolution. Um, Stacy Trosankos has a kind of summary and resume of Stanley Yockey's work called Science Was Born of Christianity, which I would recommend to your attention. So uh, immediately God gives us divine revelation for the sake of our souls and salvation and for the moral reform of the human race. Uh, but secondarily, that revelation has had a profound understand influence on our understanding of the natural world. All right. Appreciate your call, Michael. It's called a communion here on EWTN. We do have a line open if you'd like to get in before we uh, wrap things up in about uh, 10, 15 minutes. 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Charlie is watching on YouTube. The authority and infallibility of doctrine given to the Pope sits uneasy with me and is preventing me from becoming a Catholic. While the Pope is human and humans are fallible, how does the Church justify this? Thanks, Charlie. And of course, we talked about this earlier in the show. Yeah, exactly. One word in your question tripped me up. Doctrine given to the Pope. Ah. Mm, the doctrine received by the Pope. It'd be a little bit, I'd prefer that word because it's not like the Pope sits around in the Vatican and waits for, you know, for some revelation to fall out of heaven on his head. That's not how it works. All right. <laughs> 
the, the claim to infallibility is absolutely not a claim to prophetic inspiration or, in, uh, or any kind, right? That's not what we're saying about the Pope. The Pope doesn't do anything other than teach the deposit of faith that's been handed down for 2,000 years. So he's not, he's not giving out new information, right? He's protecting the deposit of faith given by Christ and the apostles from misapplication, from misinterpretation. Uh, and to do so is absolutely necessary for the coherence, the integrity of the faith. So imagine what happens when you don't have a living guide to the interpretation of the Church's tradition, as is the case with Protestantism. Ehrlich Zwingli, uh, one of the early Protestant theologians, wrote a book one time called Clarity and Certainty of the Word of God. And he was, uh, he was bothered by the fact that sometimes Catholic theologians disagree with one another. And he said, well, it's because they don't have the Bible alone. They have the Bible, but they got the way down with all this tradition. But if we just had the Bible, it would, be, it would bring <laughs> total unanimity to the Church. We would be in agreement on everything if we all just agreed to base our interpretations on Scripture alone. That was Zwingli's argument in his book, Clarity and Certainty of the Word of God, published, I think, 1525. Well, it didn't work out that way. And what no. you found out is when you remove magisterial authority from the Constitution of the Church, instantly Protestantism fractured into hundreds of different sects, and today it's you know into tens of thousands. Yeah. And even in the 16th century, Luther and Zw Luther on the one hand and Zwingli on the other hated each other, absolutely disagreed. I mean, Luther said one of us is with God, the other with S Satan. I mean, that's how stark it was. Wow. Right. And uh, and uh, he had absolutely no patience with Zwingli at all, and utterly refused to make common cause with him. He thought Zwingli was the worst of heretics. Why? Because they disagreed on the on the, the mode of Christ's presence in the Eucharist. And they both appealed to Scripture to do so. They both appealed to the standard of the Bible alone and had absolutely no agreement on what it meant. And here comes Calvin, 20 years later, says, I'll solve the problem. I'll bring unanimity where before there was conflict in the in the Protestant world. Well, he just articulates a third position. <laughs> And it's been off to the races ever since. Ever since. And every new, you know, Protestant dogmatician comes by and says he'll solve the problem of Protestant diversity by giving out the infallible interpretation, infallible by his own judgment, and it just adds one more, one more denomination, yep. right? And what's happened in Protestantism since then is they finally gave up the hope. After about two or three hundred years, they gave up the hope of Protestant unanimity. And they said, well, we're allowed to disagree about the, the little things as long as we agree on the essentials. Here's the list of essentials. Guess what happened? They couldn't agree on the list of the essentials, <laughs> right? And it just keeps going, all right? Wow. So Christ anticipated this, and he did not give us the Bible as our rule of faith. I mean, that's the whole problem. Private interpretation and the scriptures are not the rule of faith for the Christian church. If that were the case, we'd never have any certainty, never have any certainty about what to believe. Instead, he entrusted the deposit of faith to the teaching office of the Catholic bishops and the Pope. Whoever hears you, hears me. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Now you say, I find that hard to believe. Of course it's hard to believe. Of course, transubstantiation is hard to believe. Doctrine of the Trinity is hard to believe. The doctrine of the two natures of Christ is hard to believe. The resurrection from the dead is hard to believe. But it's good to believe, and there are motives to believe it, and there's evidence for believing it. But ultimately, to trust in the infallibility of the Church is not an empirical decision. I mean, I, I, I do think there's good empirical evidence, good historical evidence that the Pope has done his job over time. Good Popes, bad Popes, wise Popes, foolish Popes, but the papacy has, has succeeded in maintaining the, the integrity of the Catholic faith and the deposit of faith down for 2,000 years. It's done its job description. But I can never arrive at an act of faith in the infallibility of the Church simply based on, a, on the judgment of history any more than I could arrive at a judgment of, say, the inspiration of the Bible based on of the witness of history. Ultimately, the act of faith is an act of faith in divine revelation. It's trusting Christ, the Son of God. Because he said it, I believe it. Because Christ said, you are Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Because Christ said that, I believe it. If we're just left up to my own historical investigation, I wouldn't believe it. I believe it because Christ said it. Charlie, thanks so much for watching us on YouTube. Call to Communion here on EWTN. Let's go to Alex now in Melbourne, Florida, listening on Divine Mercy Catholic Radio, a first-time caller. Alex, what's on your mind today? Well, I'm Eastern Orthodox, uh -huh. and I've been watching news and whatnot 
that the Bishop of Rome and the Bishop of Constantinople, i.e. the Pope and the Ecumenical Patriarch, have been talking. And I'm wondering, is there any hope that the great schism will be healed? Yeah, thanks. I think there is hope. And the reason why is because Christ said it would be. Well, he prayed that it would be. In John 17, Christ uh, prayed that all those who believe in him would be one. Well, I'd like to think that Christ's prayers are efficacious. I kind of think they are. And so I think we will. I think it will be healed. And I think we've made a lot of progress, right? Um, So, you know, going all the way back to the pontificate of Paul VI, the Catholic Church has been in in ongoing ecumenical dialogue with the ecumenical patriarch and also with other other Eastern hierarchs uh, for quite a long time, and we've made a lot of progress. International theological discussions have, say, for example, arrived at sort of the general judgment that the filioque clause uh, uh, that, that the Catholics and Orthodox don't really have substantive differences in their Trinitarian theology. There's a difference of tradition and language, uh, but this is not a deal breaker the way Focius thought that it was. Um, you know, from the Catholic Church's point of view, uh, Eastern Orthodox Christians are uh, Christians that have all the sacraments, they have apostolic succession, they're so close to the heart of the Catholic Church that Eastern Orthodox Christians are permitted in Catholic law to receive many sacraments in the Catholic Church. And I have Orthodox friends that come to the Mass and go to the Catholic priest for confession and come celebrate our ordinations with us. And, yeah. and uh, there's a real sense that like we're just like so close. Now, I would also add, and I think this is worth noting, that the Catholic Church uh, does not seek to proselytize Eastern Orthodox Christians. And we don't urge them, we don't urge them to become Catholic. Because of this, because there's an awareness that these this is this is really like a family squabble, you know we're very very close, very very close together, mm-hmm. and so our prayer is not that I can proselytize you know sheep steal this or that Orthodox Christian, but that we'll heal the whole breach, that the whole church will be reconciled in a loving communion, and uh, now you know whatever happens between the Pope and the Ecumenical Patriarch is wonderful. Um, you know, the Orthodox have kind of a hard time getting all on the same page themselves. You know, so you got Moscow out there. Yeah. You know, you got, you got, you know, uh, they're different, they're different um, uh, uh, Orthodox sees, and they don't always get on the same page themselves. But as far as the Pope and the Ecumenical Patriarch, yeah, I mean, the Ecumenical Patriarch keeps a picture of John Paul II on his desk. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Alex, uh, keep praying for unity. I think we have time for one more. Here is Chris in Claysville, Pennsylvania, listening on YouTube. Chris, what's on your mind today? Good. How you doing? Very good. Um, I have a question. My question was, is I went to a Catholic church today, or last weekend for the first time in about 40 years of becoming Catholic again. And my question is, it's a, in a Protestant church, we give no reverence to Mary whatsoever. My concern is, is do we give too much in the Catholic Church to it? Because the Catholic Church I went to this weekend had very front and center, kind of like on a star or on a cross. It looked like a star, but it was like just like up and down and left and right. And there were seven stars on each side, and I didn't understand the seven stars. I could understand six stars for 12 tribes, but I was wondering what that was about. Yeah, thanks. So first of all, um, to not show any reverence to Mary is to violate the Bible, because Mary herself uh, prescribed and predicted that all generations would call her blessed. So we need to be obedient to divine revelation, the way we honor the Blessed Virgin. The book of Revelation, chapter 12, depicts the Blessed Virgin as surrounded by these stars. So this is a biblical image, and it goes to... um, the, the biblical doctrine that Mary is the second Eve. You know, the first Eve confronted the serpent, and we were all sunk. The second Mary confronted, uh, the second Eve, I should say, confronted the serpent, and we're going to win through her. And that's why the book of Revelation depicts her in battle with that ancient serpent, the devil. So the contrast in the Old and New Testament is very clear between the first Eve that lost, the second Eve who wins, and her progeny are not conceived in the natural way, but the spiritual generation of the church through her act of faith. That's why scripture calls her the mother of all those who believe in Christ. We are saved by Christ through the ministration of the church and her saints, and the Blessed Virgin is the greatest of all the saints. So, there, you know, you, you cannot err by giving Mary too much devotion kind of in intensity. Now, you know, we don't worship the Blessed Virgin Mary. We don't offer sacrifice to her the way we offer sacrifice to God in the holy sacrifice of the Mass. 
Um, but, you know, you can't love your mother too much. That's right. There you go. Chris, thanks so much for your call and uh, glad to talk with you this afternoon. Hey, Dr. David Andrews, a great show. Thank you so much. Thanks, Tom. Don't forget, we do the program Monday through Friday here on EWTN live at 2 p.m. Eastern. Please join us next time. And we have an encore for you tonight at 11 p.m. I'm Tom Price along with Dr. David Andrews. We will see you then. Have a great day. God bless. Hey, y'all, this is Father Mitch Packer. Open Line Wednesday is next on EWTN Radio.